Tonight we're continuing in this series on the revelatory ministry of the miracles of Jesus. <clears throat> the miracles of Jesus are some details of what Jesus began to do and teach. That's how Luke summarized his gospel when he wrote to Theophilus in the book of Acts. He referred to his gospel, the gospel of Luke, and said that he wrote what Jesus began to do and teach. So the miracles of Christ are in that category. Now, admittedly, these kind of messages are a little different than, than uh, what we might call exposition and expounding certain facts of the gospel. But I thought it necessary to deal with this. I, I feel a uh, weight of concern that Christ is not better known. Mm -hmm. I would venture to say that all false theology or false teaching or inaccurate emphasis is traced back to a fundamental ignorance of God and Christ. Amen. That's the mother of all mm -hmm. error. And so it's good for us to be acquainted with how Jesus worked, what he said, what he did, the type of people he was drawn to, the type of circumstances he ministered in. He, if Jesus were to come to our town, he probably wouldn't visit a lot of places that are noted for being very religious. He probably wouldn't go there. Now this particular incident doesn't deal with particular people by name. It's a, where he heals the sick of Gennesaret. Now the account is found in the 14th chapter of Matthew and the 6th chapter of Mark. The 14th chapter of Matthew, verses 34 through 36. <coughs> Jesus has just uh, been with his disciples walking on the sea. You remember walking on the sea? Peter came to him out of the boat, just following that incident. And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all that country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased, and brought him that they might and brought and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched were made whole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sure a library could have been written on that, uh -huh. <laughs> on that incident. It's just yes. a few verses. Mark 6, 53-56. When they had passed over, they came into the land of Gennesaret and drew to the shore. And when they were come out of the ship, straightway they knew him mm -hmm. and ran through that whole region round about and began to carry about in beds those that were sick where they heard he was. And whithersoever he entered into the villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch, if it were but the border of his garment, and as many as touched him were made whole. Quite, a, quite an incident. <clears throat> Now, as you look at the background of this, it had these backgrounds. I give these backgrounds because they show the kind of climate Jesus works in. It's sort of a climate Jesus works in. If, for instance, you have spent a lot of your time thinking about the world and thinking about the things you do and your job and your home and so forth, it's not wrong to do that. I understand if you have the right frame of mind. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't expect the Lord to do like great things when you come. <laughs> really, that's not the way he works. Mm -hmm. This climate is where you're God conscious. You're acutely aware of Christ. You, you're mindful of where he's going mm -hmm. and where he wants you to go. And it's in that kind of climate that he, that he works. Jesus has just sent his disciples to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, sometimes it's called the Sea of Tiberias, sometimes it's called the Sea of Gennesaret. And you'll remember that the storm rose and he came walking to them on the water, made as though he was going to pass right by them. 
That was a time when Peter walked on the water. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they got back in the boat, they were immediately on the land. And they came into the land of Gennesaret. Mm -hmm. You'll find the cross of the Gennesaret, Lake of Gennesaret in Galilee in Luke 5, 1 and Matthew 4, 18. <laughs> One account so calls it Gennesaret and the other calls it Galilee. So they, they, were, they named things different names. Gennesaret was a very, very fertile dis district, agriculturally speaking. It was the area where Tiberius and Capernaum were located in this area. It was about five, four, four miles long and three miles wide, so it wasn't an enormous place. But in this little plot of land, four miles long, three miles wide, Jesus, the scripture says, did most of his great works. <laughs> How about that? This little area. And it is a region where Jesus dwelt. Mm -hmm. He moved there after he'd uh, spent time in Nazareth, was raised in Nazareth. Scriptures tell us that he came into that area and he resided or dwelt in Capernaum. That was his base, you might say, his base of operation. And there he taught in the synagogues. I'm establishing here now the people were familiar with him. Yeah, this wasn't the first time they'd seen him. Mark 1.21 says that when he went into Capernaum straightway in the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. So this, uh, John 6.59 says these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. This, this is an area where they heard a lot about Jesus and what he did teaching in the synagogues. But... Here's the irony. Overall, Capernaum was noted for their rejection of Christ. Mm -hmm. That's quite phenomenal, isn't it? He did most of his works there, but they were, they were not noted for accepting him. Let's hear Jesus speaks to this matter. Now, this is the area of geographical area that our text takes place in. Matthew 11, 23, Jesus said, O thou Capernaum, which are exalted into heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. That's, that's the loving Jesus talking there. Luke 10, 15 says, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted into heaven, shall be thrust down to hell. You know where Jesus has a lot to say and a lot to do and there's not much response? This is dangerous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jesus takes note of this. Yeah. Amen. If you have, for instance, a town where there's 180 churches mm -hmm. and some of them have had some good things said in them, but the town is not noted for being godly, Oh. This is not overlooked. That's right. Sometimes it's easy for us to overlook and say, well, everyone, you know, everyone does it turn to the Lord. Mm -hmm. But this is logged mm -hmm. in the books. Or let's say it's a person. Let's say it's a person. Let's say it's a person that Jesus has taught a lot to, shown a lot of truth to, been very merciful to them, helped them in their calamities, but they're kind of lukewarm. They're not they're not fervent. They're not out there in front. Mm -hmm. This also is duly, duly noted. That's right. Well, this, uh, this territory was noted for rejecting Jesus. A tragedy, but this is just the way it was. This is the area where he said a prophet's not without honor, save in his own country. That's where he's not appreciated. So that's the background. He, had this time shown his disciples how powerful he was. They were dumbfounded by it. Peter walked on water. He showed his faith wasn't as strong as he thought it was. And uh, now he's back in this territory that was uh, with all of the unbelief here. It was better than the other side of the lake when they asked him to leave. <laughs> and here's the circumstances of this particular miracle or cluster of miracles. When Jesus got out of the boat and said the people knew him. We might say recognized him. Mm -hmm. I think people were more perceptive. They didn't have 
all the mechanisms you plug in your ears and blot the world out and all uh -huh. this. See, they didn't have all this kind of uh -huh. stuff back uh -huh. then. You kind of had to pay attention yes. to what was going around. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that could be said about the media and the things that people use today that kind of lift them and waft them away from if God's hands being bared, they uh -huh. never know it. They're all absorbed in their own thing, you know. Mm -hmm. But these people, they knew. I will tell you that you've got to master the art of having your eyes open and know what's going on round about you. Amen. You've got to master this art. Amen. Because Jesus doesn't always blow a horn when he comes. Uh -huh. He doesn't always ring a bell and work some great work to let you know he's there. You've got to be alert. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced that if the day ever comes and Israel turns to Christ, it'll be a couple of months before some people know it. Mm -hmm. So be alert. They knew him because he'd often been there. <coughs> Matthew 8, 5 says he entered in the synagogue there in Capernaum, where a centurion besought him. Mark 2, 1 says he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. Mm -hmm. See, so they knew about it. They knew about Jesus. Luke 7, 1, he entered his sayings in the audience of the people, and he entered into Capernaum. They're familiar with his presence. There's something to be said about being able to recognize Jesus. Matthew 14, 35 said the people had knowledge of him. Got around it. Jesus just landed over here. Yeah. People had knowledge of him. I wonder <laughs> how many people know when Jesus is around. How many people can detect it. How many people can tell when the climate of an assembly suddenly shifts and changes and people are real conscious about God, real, real conscious about what their own progress should be and uh, they sense that he's very present and very present help in the time of need. How many people like miss that? Mm -hmm. Don't know what's there. They knew. Mm -hmm. You know what here there's a principle to be seen that wherever Jesus is present and people pay attention, he captures the attention yeah. of people. They didn't say the disciples are here. They didn't say Peter's here. He walked on water. See? Their attention was drawn toward Jesus. Jesus is a dominating personality. If you can ever yes. get Jesus into people's minds, mm -hmm. he, he dwarfs everything else. Amen. It does happen. They did not know much about Jesus. If you were to ask them for a lesson on Jesus, they probably couldn't have told you very much. They probably knew very little compared to what you know, but they knew enough about him. The noise that are brought and be drawn to him. The slightest <coughs> valid knowledge of Jesus is compelling. If you're like a child and you just know a couple of key things about Jesus, you really don't, it'll draw you. This is the way Jesus person is. Why he must be known. He must be known. People must know more about Jesus than they do about church movements. They must. They must know more about Jesus than they do about, say, the law. Yeah, amen. Or about what's proper in conduct. It's mm -hmm. important to know those things, yeah. but you've got to know more about Jesus than you know about that. Yes, amen. So if, you're, if you feel as though you're deficient in the area of knowing Jesus himself, well, that's what you want to concentrate on because that's the key to every other, Amen. Every other knowledge. And what do the people do? They, <laughs> I love what it, what, it, what it says about it. It says they ran through the whole region. Mm -hmm. Matthew 14, 35 says they sent out into the country round about. They sent the word out. Jesus is here. Jesus is here. He was there, you know, a short time before, and then he left to go over to Gadara. Mark 6, 55 says they ran through the whole region round about. Well, when you, when you look at a plot of land four miles by three miles, that's not very big unless you're running all through it. And then all of a sudden that could be a quite a significant piece of land. But they're running through there, telling all about it. And what did they do? They... They rounded up all the diseased people. Now you you got to see here the faith of these this yeah. pe these people. This was sort of an inferior faith next to what's experienced in Christ. But these people, you don't do something like this unless you're convinced. Yeah. You don't do this for an experiment. Mm -hmm. You might hear that someone who is purported to do a lot of healing is in town, and someone may bring one two people, get a friend, bring them or something like that. But this isn't what they did. 
they rounded up all the all the sick people. Matthew 14, 35 says they sent into all that country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased. Well, that's quite a statement. Yes. What if you had to round up everyone sick in Joplin? Could you just imagine? I mean, could you imagine what? It's quite a statement. Uh huh. They rounded them all up. And they begin, Mark 6, 55 and 56 says, they begin to carry about in beds those that were sick where the, when they heard where he was. So it was one thing to go say, here, come with us. Another thing to carry the bed with them on here. So something else. So you remember that time when four men carried one man? Well, here there's a whole lot of them carrying a lot of people, bringing them all in to the Lord Jesus. And Jesus didn't send them home. In fact, uh, the scriptures tell us that in Mark's account of this that he went and visited throughout all the villages and towns and cities in that area. And here's what it said they did, Mark 6:56. Whether it's wherever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment. Picture, I mean, can you got to kind of picture this in your mind? Just a minute. I've been down Rain's Line, seeing people carry placards. I've seen you've seen this. Perhaps they've been crusading against something. They carry placards, but I've, ne I've never seen people laying sick in the street. I've never seen anything like this. But that's what they did. They weren't carrying a crusading for. <laughs> they were laying the sick in the like, so he'd have to confront them and lay them in a the street where he was walking. That was the idea. Laid them there. So you hear the background of this, this miracle. These people, these people were eager to see Jesus, and and they just didn't run up and start touching his garment. They asked him. <laughs> they asked him. Mark, Matthew fourteen thirty six says they besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. Uh -huh. They asked him. They asked him to do this. Yes. Mark says they besought him that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment. Just let us just. Where did they get this idea? Well, so far as we know, there's only one other instance where uh -huh. anybody did this. This is, so I, I'm assuming that word must have got around about that woman with the issue of blood that just touched the border. Amen. If I can just touch something that's connected with you, Jesus. Uh -huh. if I, just something that you're wearing, just anything that's connected with you, something that you're associated with. If I can just touch, if I can just get some place where you are. Yeah. I insist that people who go to church don't normally think like this. Mm -hmm. They don't normally think about is Jesus there. That's the fact in our society. This is the last thing they think about. Yeah. Is Jesus there? This is the first thing they thought about. Where is Jesus? They said they carried him where Jesus was. Mm -hmm. When they knew where he was, they took him there. It's a great secret. I'm convinced that... Uh, Although people have concocted a lot of explanations for why there's kind of a dearth of these kind of works. It's one thing to say Jesus can do this and Jesus can do that, but it's another thing to be honest enough to say, hey, it's not happening on this scale. Yeah. And if someone says it is, there's something wrong here. Mm -hmm. either, they're, either they're stupid or they're lying. It's one or the other. Because it's not, not even in foreign countries is it happening on this scale. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. We can tell you that when we were in Pakistan, there were things like this, but not a, not like this. Mm -hmm. The miracles that we have seen and heard of today, we thank God for them. But like I seriously question, we would have them written in the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. And in chapter 29 and include these things. They're just of a different order mm -hmm. than what we read here. It's remarkable. They ask him. See, they knew something about him that people have missed in our day, brothers and sisters. People in our day do not connect Jesus in their thinking. They do not connect Jesus with things that are wondrous. The connection's not made. Some people just wonder, what does he want us to do? Some people, that's as far as they get. Other people, they have an immediate crisis on hand. That's, that's pretty much what they could do. But these people... They seem to sense that it would make a difference if we could get these sick in his path, if we could just get it there, he'll do something about it. Then they ask him, let us just touch your, touch your clothes. Now, remember that woman that touched him with the issue of blood when he was on the way to Jairus' house, 
Remember he said, who touched me? And the disciples said, everybody's touching you. Well, see, they didn't, those other people didn't ask. Uh, they didn't ask. <laughs> and the woman, she reasoned in herself, very private. She didn't discuss it with the people on the way. So I, I take this as quite a, quite a commentary on the people. There's a certain order that surrounds Jesus. Amen. There's a certain order. You've got to kind of get out of the chaotic mm -hmm. and get into the order mm -hmm. when you're with Jesus. Yes. No wonder Paul said, let all things be done decently and in order. Mm -hmm. yes. Just don't barge in and think that Jesus is going to honor our barging. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Let's, uh, let's bring supplication into the matter. And the scripture says that as, as many as touched him were made whole. Only as many as touched him. Matthew 14, 36 says as many as touched him were made perfectly whole. Mark 6, 56 says as many as touched him were made whole. Just as many as touched him. No more. Not as many as saw him, they weren't. As many as touched him. Notice he touching his clothes equated to touching him. He didn't say as many as touched his clothes, but he has touched him. Truth, see, truth is like a garment to Jesus. The gospel is like clothes for Jesus. If you if you can see what's in the gospel and get hold of it, you'll actually get hold of Christ. Just like touching his clothes got hold of got hold of him. I love the truth. As many as touched him are made whole. <clears throat> Now, perfectly whole, that's, that's what you can talk about perfectly whole. Mm -hmm. to, be, to be perfectly whole, that's, yeah. that's something else. Yeah. Remember that woman of the issue of blood that says she was made whole, complete, from that hour. You want to know how rare being made whole is? How many are here among us that are whole? This is not a common, this is not a common... This is not a common thing since Adam. It's been very uncommon for any person to be whole. Mm -hmm. Matthew 12, 13. The man with the withered hand, he stretched it forth and it was restored as the other, like the other, was made whole. Jairus' daughter was made whole from the hour. When Jesus came into the house. John 7, 23, Jesus spoke of a man he healed, said he made him every whit whole. Now, Jesus deal, this is what Jesus does. He makes people whole. Now, I understand that uh, there's these instances like we've just read about here. They made people perfectly whole. Well, you will notice that in the, in the epistles, when they begin to open up the ministry of Jesus Christ, they didn't draw people's attention to this, even though they practiced this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Reliance on Jesus to make them physically perfectly whole. But when it comes to what the apostles preached, they preached something that talked about moral wholeness and spiritual wholeness. Because physical wholeness isn't going to amount to much when you get ready to die. You're going to have yeah. to drop all that anyway. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You want to see in this ministry that Jesus is concerned about perfect wholeness. Mm -hmm. Amen. And it has like a priority, spirit, uh -huh. soul, <laughs> body. It has kind of a priority, according to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. And you can be whole in every one of those areas. Spirit, soul, and body. Yes. Now notice the total lack of chaos in all of this. Normally you get a big crowd together. And they're all looking for a benefit. You've got chaos, but there's no chaos here at all. It's perfectly order, orderly. And I think you can safely say that when you come into the presence of Jesus, there's a certain orderliness that begins to characterize your life. Your mind kind of gets calmed down so that it can think more soundly, and your feelings are subdued so that you can have peace and joy, and these sort of things are peace, joy, and righteousness. These are the sort of things that are experience in a stable environment when it's not shifting to and fro. <clears throat> and as I mentioned to you, there's only two instances so far as we know of people touching Christ's clothing and being made whole. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't look for that. That just means, well, there's very special things that Jesus can do. <laughs> and you want to think of him in that, in that context. <clears throat> now I want to make a few observations on this, on this whole event. <clears throat> First of all, Jesus puts himself within your reach. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing you want to see here. That Jesus came back and put himself within the reach of the people in Gennesaret. 
If Jesus doesn't make himself available, you'll not be able to find him. Amen. You just won't. But this is his manner. Mm -hmm. There's another reason for being alert and having a sensitive spirit. Because when Jesus comes near, you'll sense it. And that's, that's the time you can do something about it. Secondly, <clears throat> Jesus had healed the sick of the people in this area before he let head over to Gadara. When he left, he'd healed a lot of people, if you remember. Mm -hmm. And taught a lot of people. And he went over to Gadara and he came back and they got blessed again. Mm -hmm. The same area. That's right. So you learn from this that after initially being blessed, Jesus can return and bless you more. Mm -hmm. Amen. So the main thing isn't just to get a blessing. The main thing is an A single experience. The main thing is a visit for Jesus to visit your area. He already visited this area. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But he visited it again. And the people went out again. And the people were healed again. See? Very good. It's possible to reject Jesus even though he has frequent visits. Here's Capernaum. We read to you what Jesus said to Capernaum. He'd been exalted into heaven. How would she been exalted into heaven? Heaven's messenger was living there. He's living there, working there, doing most of his mighty works there, exalted into heaven. If there is a place, any place, where Jesus is particularly working, particularly making things known, particularly showing who he is, people better beat a path there. Yes, yes. yes. Now they may say, we don't like where it is. Well... He was by the seashore here. It wasn't in a nice, commodious building. Uh -huh. I don't think people see this. I think there's a different kind of thing that drives the religion of our day. Yes. You've got to have kind of a famous person after yeah. the flesh. Yeah. Or uh -huh. someone's been in the newspaper or the placards. You're at least a big brotherhood dignitary. Or, you see, is driven by a completely different principle. Yeah. <laughs> and that, in my understanding, is why there's not a lot being done. Yeah. <coughs> So it's possibly visited <coughs> frequently by Jesus and it not change it. He's nothing more than a novelty, mm -hmm. kind of like a circus person. Uh -huh. Here's something else. When you recognize Jesus, you've got to do something about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. when, you, when you sense the presence of the Lord or you sense that he's working with your heart or you have this sensitivity about I need to do this or that in regard to Christ. You had better capitalize on the moment because you do not know whether tomorrow you will have that or not. Yes. These kind of feelings, they come and go. Believe me, I can tell you from experience. There's times when you can feel very, very close to God and you think in yourself, this is never going to fade. Yeah. I just think this is just going to glow like this. Well, this isn't the way it is. Yeah. We're in a world where this doesn't happen. So when you sense the presence of Jesus, so you're particularly conscious of Him, then's the time to gather what needs to be done and bring Amen. it yeah. Amen. to Jesus. And faith can gather all the problems. Yes. It says they gathered all the disease. I don't know how many there were, but what a task. I, yeah. boy, but they did it. They got it done. Mm -hmm. They gathered them all and put them in the street if necessary. They got them all in the vicinity where Jesus was and the cities in the villages He was entering. They got them there. And you can get your needs there too. Mm -hmm. Amen. You can gather them up, mm -hmm. bring them in. And you'll learn another thing about in this instance that you cannot, faith does not impose upon Jesus. It supplicates or petitions or asks or pleads. This is what faith does. Mm -hmm. Faith doesn't just impose itself upon Jesus. When the scripture says we cast our burden on the Lord, it just means it doesn't mean you throw your net over him and he's all caught up in your problems. That's not what it means. It means you divest yourself mm -hmm. of it. And involved in this is supplications, asking, pleading, inquiring. Mm -hmm. Faith does this. <clears throat> Another thing you learn in this series of miracles here is that it's good to know where Jesus is. Yes. yes. Where is he? Is he everywhere? Well, in a sense, he is, but in another sense, he isn't. He's not accessible everywhere. 
you might go down and frequent the local bar room or nightclub or strip club, and you're not going to find Jesus in there. That's right. This isn't the kind of place he goes. That's right. Now, you might go to the synagogue, you'd find him there. You might go to the temple, you'd find him there. But the rest of the time, you had to know where he went, and he just wasn't found in places Amen. like that. Amen. Search the scriptures and see. Right. He wasn't in among riotous people. That isn't where he went. That's right. So it's good to know where he is. Amen. And there is such a thing as being perfectly whole. You don't have to learn to live with a state of unwholeness. Yes. Go well, for more grace to take the case to Christ. Amen. I can tell you from personal experience that there are times in, when I struggle with this unbelief. Not doubting who Jesus is and uh -huh. that sort of what we're talking about. Uh -huh. Is wondering what you're doing on top of the water, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Like Peter had. Mm -hmm. Wondering whether it's his will and this sort of thing. But there is such a thing as being relieved of that. Mm -hmm. And you should pursue it. Now faith knows if Jesus will come by, <clears throat> a blessing can be received. So that's why they laid the sick in the street. It's good to it's good to get your problems out where Jesus is. Here's another thing to learn. Every valid blessing is not demonstrated over and over. Like touching. See, you couldn't codify this. Say, yep, we can announce whoever can touch his clothes. Yeah, you can, I can almost hear the, the statisticians, you know. If you can just touch his clothes, we've got it right here. We've got a woman here that touched his clothes. We, we got a group of people in Ganesha that touch his clothes. So there's power in the clothes. That's what it is. If you can just touch the clothes. Well, they'd have completely missed it. That wasn't always the way it was. Right. Sometimes Jesus had to put his fingers in your ears and spit on your tongue. Mm -hmm. That's what he did one time. Mm -hmm. So it's good to know that uh, what he, the way he blesses one person isn't the way he blesses every person. It's the outcome of the thing that's important. If you want a blessing, you've got to be willing to oppress in and obtain it. If Jesus is there, you can't just sit at home and pray, boy, I hope he comes, I hope he comes down our street. I surely hope he comes to our church. Boy, sure is nice that Jesus is in Joplin. Let's all have a prayer meeting and we'll pray that he comes to our church. Well, why not get up and go where he is? Mm -hmm. That's what they did. They went where he was. And a lot of blessings aren't obtained simply because people want to stay where they're at. Mm -hmm. And don't want to get up and yeah, go where yeah. Jesus is. Sometimes you can be in a room in your house, but in your heart you got to get up and go someplace else in your heart where Jesus is. And we would surely have experienced this, yeah. Yeah. this sort of thing. You've got to go where, where he frequents. Faith can transport you, see, move you into those areas. And finally, when Jesus is available, don't let other priorities rob you. When a feast is prepared, don't say, I got some business, I got to go check some oxen out. Huh? When Jesus is available and invites you to come to him, say, I bought a piece of land, I better go look at it. Or say, I married a wife and can't come. Don't have other priorities. There are no, there's no priority worth forfeiting Christ. Amen. There isn't any. I can tell you also from personal experience that anytime you inconvenience yourself for Jesus, you will not be ashamed. Amen. You will not be confounded or disappointed. Yes. Now let's give one final uh, word on this. <clears throat> Why are these things written in the Bible? Just accounts of what Jesus did. Why didn't he have a gospel kind of itemized the, in priority the various teachings of Jesus? Why, why, why didn't they do that? Why didn't, why didn't, instead of John recording this, why didn't he just take the various sayings of Jesus and classify them in order their importance and list them? Because after all, maybe people might think your mind is your biggest asset. Mm -hmm. And so if you can just get kind of get these things in your mind, you'll be able to sort it out and do what's right. Well, he did it because your chief asset isn't your mind. Your chief asset is your heart. And these things do appeal to your heart. See, John said these things are written 
that you might believe. And that believing you might have life through his name. So in these events, these are chronicling the person of Christ. There's something about Jesus being made known in this. Mm -hmm. It's not really, I, I can't itemize all of the things myself. I, I, can, I can have no trouble confessing this. I can't see everything about Jesus as resident in this. But see, God, it's just not accumulating all the information. That's right. not the point. You've got to know the things about Jesus that pertain to your situation. Mm -hmm. You've got to see the part of Jesus that applies to where you're at. Mm -hmm. We're not all in the same place. We haven't all came the same distance. We don't know all the same things. But you, that these things are written so each person can read this and you can extract from here what's necessary for you to kind of get your feet on the ground. And I bid you to do that. What, what, what does it mean when you you believe on his name? What do, mean, what do we mean when we say that? We mean that you can correlate the Son of God with your personal need. Mm -hmm. You can make that association. That's believing Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And you can see the relevance of it mm -hmm. to you. It's just not like studying a his George Washington. Right. Or learning about historical character. They say, you can connect, this is the one I need. Amen. And you can see why. See, you see why. That's why these things are written. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thank God for it.